Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, good night in France uh, and uh, good morning in uh, the West Coast. Sorry for uh, for doing that so early for you. I I actually just realized that Olympia was so West Coast. I I don't know. I imagine it was like in the in the uh, center of the country. No. I don't know. I, yeah, I have to learn more about uh, the yeah. U.S. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're we're as far west as we get as you get. If you go yeah. if you go further west, you're in Hawaii or Japan or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. So um, uh, yeah, so we are uh, really happy tonight to welcome uh, Arrington de Dioniso, so from West Coast, uh, not California. It's uh, West no. Coast uh, North, West Coast, but uh, yeah. yeah. So welcome. Thank you for uh, for yeah. being here. Thank you so much for having me, Pauline. It's a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, people, please uh, ask question if you are for Arrington, and uh, and we will uh, answer everything tonight. Um, so yeah, first uh, I would like to uh, maybe you can just uh, present yourself, or uh, if people don't know you, or if maybe they can learn more about you. In a few okay. Words. Well, uh, so I think we're we're primarily here because CEOs. For those watching on my feed, if you don't know, CEOs uh, is a really wonderful company based in Paris, France, that designs three D printed mouthpieces. Um, but what they do is is so unique is that they they will design the mouthpiece to your own sort of personal specifications. Um, and so this uh, bass clarinet mouthpiece uh, was made sort of to, you know, we, we, we had a meeting and we talked about the kinds of things that I desire in my sound. And they, uh, they gave me a few different prototypes to try. And then we decided, ah, yeah, this, this is the one. And it's actually a, a signature mouthpiece that has my name on it. And that's, that's very cool. Uh, and, and if you want to try to play my mouthpiece, you can actually order it from Cios. Um, I've been playing bass clarinet since 1990-ish, so about, uh, 30, about 30 years, 31 years. Uh, it's my favorite instrument. I play a lot of other instruments as well, but that's the main thing. And the thing that I was most um, interested in kind of discussing with Cios when we met about creating this mouthpiece is that I'm not, I'm a self-taught player. Uh, and, and I, the music that I play on bass clarinet is in a very sort of um, extreme dimension of, of, of performing. Uh, I'm not a jazz player per se. I'm, I'm definitely not a classical player. And so the thing that we talked about is that, you know, when you're trying to buy a mouthpiece for a bass clarinet or for a saxophone, almost every mouthpiece that's marketed to musicians is either going to be a classical style of mouthpiece for symphonic music or chamber music, or it's going to be, you know, a jazz mouthpiece. Uh, and so if you're, if you're playing in a, a style of music that is not that one or the other, uh, you, you don't really have as many options or you have to kind of, you know, f find your way around with, with, with whatever is available. Um, with, with, uh, with this mouthpiece, um, it's extremely open, it's very loud, and I can get all of the, uh, the rich kind of multiphonic tones that I, uh, that I that I gravitate towards, and 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 that that forms the basis of my uh, my approach to playing and and the sounds that I make, and so I'm very happy with it. Uh... Yeah, maybe, maybe you <laughs> yeah. can uh, you can make a demo so we can hear your sound. Yeah, I'll do a little demo. I, there's actually somebody sleeping upstairs, oh. but because we're we're still <laughs> early, we're still early in the morning here, but uh, yeah, I I don't I I don't think he'll understand. That's 
that's just a, a little a little taste. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll do more later. <laughs> yeah, when it is hot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. So you yeah. introduce more, uh, more us than you. So <laughs> yeah. maybe you can uh, talk uh, oh. some more about your, uh, your music experience. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, okay. So, um, when I started out on the bass clarinet, um, like, like, like as I said, I'm, I'm self-taught. I didn't, I didn't take lessons. I didn't learn to read music originally. Um, when I, when I first picked it up, you know, I had no idea if I was playing B flat or C sharp or, you know, whatever. I had no idea. Um, I set out to take this very sort of instinctual approach. And when I learned about multiphonics, this idea that you can kind of play two or three notes at once by, you know, changing your embouchure, doing different things with your fingers, uh, you know, opening the tube at a, at a higher register and whatnot, uh, I decided I'm going to learn how to play every single sound that is wrong. <laughs> and and, and when, I, when I've mastered every single possible wrong sound, all the wrong ways to play this instrument, then I'll go backwards. And, you know, this is 30 years ago. So now, you know, if if you say I you know play a D okay I know where a D is I know I, I I can play melodies and and things if I want to I've 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 taught myself you know some of the more kind of basic things as well um, but that I was I was kind of more like a you know when they say like if you leave a monkey on a desert island for a million years it'll type out Shakespeare or whatever um, so that's kind of been my approach to learning um, but that that path of of playing in that way has brought me to some really interesting places because uh i found that when i went to uh uh well you know this is many years of playing and you know free improvisation and kind of experimental rock and roll bands like old time religion and uh malaikat dancinga and things like that uh but when i traveled elsewhere in places like indonesia uh, where I've done a lot of music with uh, uh, local musicians all over Java and Sulawesi um, and other other areas, um, when I when I bring my playing approach into uh, traditional music ensembles in Indonesia, um, it's it's actually a very natural fit, and so I've been invited to play uh, uh, quite a lot in uh, in Java with you know, different uh, music festivals and kind of these village, uh, uh, like trans, trans music uh, ceremonies and villages uh, in East Java. And so that's, that's kind of become sort of a specialty uh, of, of a, a type of music that I really enjoy playing very much. But uh, I guess the problem for me is that it, uh, it requires an entire village to, uh, to create these kinds of uh, ceremonies and festivals. So uh, when I'm here alone in Olympia, Washington, uh, I don't really have, uh, I don't really have the same kind of people to play with. So uh, I, you know, I do other projects here. Yeah. Okay. And so as a self-taught musician, how did you mm -hmm. uh, get to the, the bass clarinet? Because it's not the more usual instrument. Like no. usually you start with guitar or... Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well, and I, and I mean, I, I play guitar too and, and uh, you know, piano and things like that when I was younger. Uh, but bass clarinet, you know, I think... And I, and I really wasn't ever interested in going to saxophone or even the regular B-flat clarinet initially. Uh, and honestly, to tell you the truth, the first time that I remember listening to a bass clarinet was on Trap Mask Replica by Captain Beefheart. Uh, there are, you know, I think three or four songs uh, that have a bass clarinet on, on Trap Mask Replica. And it's, you know, the, the guy playing it, uh, he's, he's not a professional player at all. I mean, he... he He's self-taught as well, but I think when they recorded that album, he was, uh, you know, literally 
self-taught and that he'd only been playing it about a month or so. And, you know, when you hear it, you can tell, like, okay, this guy, you know, he's he's playing very instinctually, but there's something about how it fits in the songs um, that it's really perfect, you know, and it's just this low growling tone. And, you know, I, I, I heard Trap Mask Replica, I was maybe 13 or 14 years old uh, when I first heard it. And that sound was so distinctive uh, because this is this very extreme kind of avant-garde rock and roll album that, you know, kind of changed history in a lot of ways. And then there's just this, this, this growling sound there kind of in the background. I was like, what is that? Um, and this was also right around the same time that I really started getting deep into throat singing as well. Um, and, and, um, kind of integrating the sounds of, of music from Tuva and, uh, Siberian kind of shamanic music. And so when you're playing the multiphonics, on, on the lower register of the bass clarinet, there's something sort of acoustically what you're doing is very similar to what you're doing in a, in a Kargira throat singing technique uh, that you do in the back of your throat. And so learning both of those techniques at the same time and kind of finding my, my own way of integrating that approach to sound, um, I've always kind of considered bass clarinet as like a, it's like a natural acoustic amplifier for what I'm already doing with the voice. So, so I've always been a singer with an instrument uh, in, in that regard. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So how would you describe your song? Like what words would you use to, to describe it? Uh, well, okay, so it's, uh, I guess, guttural is, is a word. Um, uh, there are, um, hmm, ecstatic, I mean, is a kind of obvious word. Um, you know, f instinctual, maybe, I don't know, intuitive. Um, those those are all good words. Um, let's see. I I'm getting cunt. Oh, okay. Thank you. Getting some comments on. Yeah, on which quite the rebellion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's actually one of my favorite albums that came out in two thousand one, and um, out of all the records with uh, my band Old Time Religion. Um, I will. I'll say this: I, if 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 anybody out there has never listened to Old Time Religion, uh, that album, Witchcraft Rebellion, is a is a really excellent place to start. Um, so you can you can listen to that online, and you can actually find it on the Old Time Religion Bandcamp. Um, so that's that's that's. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm glad you like that record. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's also one of my favorites as well. Uh, okay, so we, we talked about like the, the villages and all the, the, the spiritual uh, dimension, dimension. Yeah. so how do you relate it to your son? Like, uh, what's, what's the dimension, the spiritual dimension uh, in your mm. exploration of sound and, and vibrations? Mm. Okay. Well, um. I think I, I, it's, it's not, it's, it's a complicated question to answer. Um, I think specifically with, with the multiphonics, you know, um, I guess the standard approach that most people take with like a melodic instrument is that, you know, you're playing a melody and that, you know, you're going from one note to another note to another note and that, you know, is some part of us a, a song or what have you. With with multiphonics, you know, you might start with a fundamental tone, but you're also kind of you're stretching that tone, you're pushing that tone because uh, every tone is, of course, composed of many other tones as overtones. And if you 
You know, you do certain things with your lips or your tongue or kind of pushing the sound from the back of your throat or, or changing the fingering of the instrument. Um, you can uh, create a whole range of overtones with, with whatever note you're starting with. Um, and so to think about that in a, in a sort of a spiritual way or uh, even, a, I don't know, a, a metaphysical way, you know, it's not just the first tone you hear. It's, it's, it's like with light, you know, if you shine a light through a prism, it might seem like a, a white light in the beginning, but then if you look at the reflection on the wall, you actually have a rainbow going through that prism. So when you start playing multiphonics and, and getting into this kind of overtone music, um, you could say that that's a very similar thing to what you're doing with sound. It's like breaking it up into rainbows. Um, and uh, yes, and, and with flute, you can do the same thing with flutes as well. Um, I actually have, um, I have an overtone flute right here. This is a, a very beautiful long flute called Lalove. It's from central Sulawesi, uh, Indonesia. And uh, I play this a lot as well. Uh, also uh, doing overtone music. Um, maybe a little later I'll play that. Uh, <laughs> okay, so yeah. you can wait at the end. We will have yeah. all the demo of the instruments. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Like, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's time to wake up now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So who was your big uh, inspiration uh, during all your musical journey? Um, well, uh, you know, as, as so uh, I guess an interesting thing to talk about is kind of if you're of my generation, I, I was born in 1975, I'm some 46 years old. And so if you're of that age, we uh, we grew up in a very particular generation where we were the last people really to go to high school and even college uh, without the World Wide Web. Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I guess I had Internet in college, but I didn't really know how to use it. So mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't count. Uh, I, I didn't you know, I, I knew that there were things called websites, but I didn't really know what they were or how, how they worked. Uh, I think I had an email account by the time I, uh, you know, was in my last year of college. So that means that if you were trying to do research on a particular subject, especially a very obscure subject, mm -hmm. um, you really had to take it upon yourself to really do research you had to dig through archives you had to go to libraries and universities you had to ask people you had to talk to people if you wanted to learn certain information that wouldn't just be you know uh you know the how-to guide on playing multiphonics on bass clarinet there no such yeah. book there's no such book that ever existed so learning that kind of information and finding other people who played in that way uh, sometimes took years. Um, I didn't I didn't actually know who Eric Dolphy was until I'd been playing bass clarinet for maybe two, two or three years. And someone told me, oh, hey, you need to listen to Eric Dolphy. Mm -hmm. I don't know why the feedback is happening. Um, anyway, so I was working at the radio station at my college, uh, which is Radio K-A-O-S, Radio Chaos. And they had a very big library of all kinds of really weird independent music from all over the world. And I learned about this uh, very unique and obscure uh, player named Arthur Doyle. And I became a huge Arthur Doyle fan because he had a... He had a, a very particular technique to playing tenor sax, but he also played bass clarinet, where he was vocalizing, like actually like singing and shouting through the horn while playing. 
And, um, you know, we had this very raw, very just very abrasive, guttural, uh, kind of screaming approach. Uh, he could also do things that were quite lyrical sometimes. Um, but, but that was the, sa that was the first saxophone or clarinet player that I listened to. And I really tried to emulate the specific techniques. Um, later I learned about Charles Gale, who had a similar kind of style, very free form, uh, you know, kind of in the more extreme end of free jazz. Um, uh, I honestly didn't start li listening to Arthur, uh, uh, Albert, I, I didn't start listening to Albert Eiler until I had already been playing for uh, maybe about five or six years. And, and, but, but because someone heard me playing and they're like, oh, you need, you know, you need to listen to Albert Eiler. So then I started listening to Albert Eiler. And of course, uh, I mean, obviously now uh, I, I hold Albert Eiler in the very highest esteem. I mean, he's one of the most important um, saxophone players. Um, he, yeah, he never played bass clarinet, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, he's more known for tenor sax. But, um, but some of the techniques can be applied on, on both instruments. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting... Yeah, well, I can read your questions. If you oh, okay. okay. Yeah, because I, 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 took, I took my glasses off because the glare was kind of, the, no, the, okay. the, it was kind of annoying. Will, so. Yeah, I will read that. Yeah, yeah so it was uh, da David who was asking, how would you describe your personal relationship with the Internet today? Well, you know, I mean, that's kind of the, that's also the tragedy of our generation because we're, we're the last generation to uh, graduate high school without the internet, but we were the first generation to really kind of get into this sort of social media with, uh, yeah. you know, Friendster and MySpace and Facebook and all that. And so, um, you know, the, the first tours that I did uh, in the U.S., um, the first tours I did, you, you, you had a little book that had every phone number for mm -hmm. every, every city in the country. You'd have someone's phone number. You'd, you'd have a page where you wrote down the directions. So you'd have a page that would have like a little map from how to yeah. get from the, the highway to a club. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'd have all these addresses, phone numbers and things like that. Uh, you know, you'd have all the names of the record stores because sometimes you wouldn't know the name of the club, but you could, you could call a record store and be like, Hey, like we're a band, we're on tour. Uh, mm -hmm. what's, what's the name of a good club in town? And, you know, sometimes the guy working at the record store would be like, Oh, well, actually when I get off work at the record store, I work at this club and I do sound at this place. So, uh, I'll, you know, I'll book you a show. So there was this sort of network that was very underground, very word of mouth. You know, you had to get a recommendation from somebody who knew somebody. But in a lot of ways, you had to work a little bit harder to make those contacts. But it was a much more authentic and valuable connection in the end. Um, you know, nowadays, if you're booking a tour or promoting a new album or something like that, you know, someone gives you a list and it's like, you know, here's 2000 emails. OK, so you send an email to 2000 people from some list. Maybe you send an email to 5000 people. Well, I think you know what happens when you do that. You might get one or two replies because everybody else on this list is also getting hundreds of emails a day from, you know, some brand new album, some brand new artist on tour, somebody wants to book a show, somebody wants to promote a record. Um, it's, it's extremely saturated and it's actually more difficult to find the specific types of things that you're interested in because everybody's sort of trying to promote themselves. So that's my relationship to internet now. I mean, you know, I make things, I put it on the internet, I, I, I'm a painter, I also do visual art. Um, it's become, you know, with COVID, the only way you can promote your painting, uh, because you don't have a, an art gallery anymore. 
you know, you, you know, you put paintings on the internet and you hope people uh, are curious about that. You put, you put your music on the internet, you hope people are curious about it. Um, but it's actually, I think, a lot more difficult in in a way than just uh, mm -hmm. uh, reaching directly to your audience. I I don't know. It's it's complicated. You kind of have to do both now. Um, I think for me, for my my post COVID uh, reality, I'm trying to strategize. I'm trying to strategize ways where I can do more things with less internet. Um, mm -hmm. I think it will be a challenging road. I think it'll be complicated, but um, that's my that's my goal uh, that I'm imagining doing. Um, and if it means that I'm just uh, you know, playing in the park and oh, see who see who's walking by that day. Uh, that might be what I do for a little while, uh, you know, just to kind of break up this whole kind of thing. Like, you know, they say if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, does it make a sound? Well, people are that way with the internet. If it's if it's not on your website, if it's not on Facebook, if it's not on Instagram. It just doesn't exist. So I'm I'm going to look for ways to kind of break up that sort of monopoly on on how we think about what we do. Um, even though here we are on the internet, yeah. but you know, but it, but it's 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 cool because I'm talking to somebody in in Paris, and it's we're having a live conversation. Uh, I I mean that's a very beautiful thing. So you know we we have to adapt. We've got to use both. You know, we have to take both approaches because there's no other way that I could talk to somebody in Paris. And, you know, in the old days, if you wanted to call somebody in Paris, it would cost you like a you'd, fortune. <laughs> you know, you'd, you'd, you'd spend like 30 or 40 dollars to, to talk as long as we're talking now. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess even more like it is, it's <laughs> very, crazy. really expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's um, yeah, it's 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 interesting. Like uh, I guess, yeah, we we need to to get the the best from both sides. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, like with COVID, nowadays we are always um, behind our computer and trying to mm -hmm. yeah speak with. I I'm even speaking with my old team by by Zoom every day because mm. uh, we are not allowed to be all together in the same room right now. So. Yeah. But yeah, we are very much looking forward to to like real relationship in person. That's yeah. we realize that it's nice too, like uh, and real concerts, like not live streaming concerts. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, you told me earlier, like before the live, that uh, so you may have a, a tour booked in Europe in uh, November. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah, and that's with old time religion. So this is, uh, you know, this is my first band. We started in 1995, and uh, we, um, you know, we used to tour in Europe quite a lot. But the last, uh, the last tour we did in Europe, I think, was 2008, and then the band, um, you know, we never, we never broke up. We just kind of, everybody was living in different cities. We were all doing different projects. Um, I started a different band, Malaikat Dansinga, and uh, then I started going to Indonesia a lot. And so, you know, we were all developing different interests. And then we had a reunion. Uh, this was in 2018. We got back together and did a US tour, but, um, we we weren't able to do a tour in Europe. We were supposed to play last year. Uh, we were supposed to play April of 2020, and then when COVID started, they they rebooked it to November 2020. And then as things were going on, we were talking with the booking agent, and we we're like, okay, let's try two thousand. Let's try November 2021. Okay. So so now here we are in April, and you know, November is, uh, it's about six months away. So we will see what happens. Uh, the dates are all booked. Uh, all the, all the dates are already confirmed. Um, but 
I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Let's hope it would we'll... uh, to be okay. Like our president we'll... in France, our president just told us like uh, uh, they will open everything in in May. So nobody is wow. uh, believing that. But <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will see, we will see what happens. I I really don't know. Um, so do you have no. a, a, a show booked in Paris? Absolument, ouais. Oh, <laughs> yeah. nice. Yeah. Where? Uh, you know, I don't. I f I don't remember the name of the club. Um, uh, it seems like. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I think. <laughs> okay. I th I think it's December first. Okay. December first in Paris. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't know the location. I would uh, check it. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I have it written down somewhere. I, I can look it up and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you know, but, uh, I don't, I don't remember what it is right now. Uh, yeah. I hope, I, <laughs> I hope I will be able to, to see you play then in I hope so. December. That would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we, we talked about uh, the bass clarinet. So you, you also mm -hmm. play other instruments. What what instruments do you play? What? Well, so bass clarinet. Uh, I I you know all the different uh, the you know the bamboo instruments that I got in uh, Indonesia. Um, I play. Oh, I play uh, an interesting one that I can play for you now. Um, Now, uh, this instrument has many different names. In French, you will call it gambaud. Uh, yeah. We also we call it uh, jaw harp or juice harp. Uh, but because this is actually uh, a Russian uh, instrument, I call it chomuz, or that's the uh, you know the Siberian name vargan or chomuz. And I've been playing this even longer than bass clarinet. <laughs> So the interesting thing about this is we were talking before about fundamental tones and harmonics and and playing overtone music either with the voice or with uh, a wind instrument with with the mouth harps it's all harmonics and and overtones because the uh, when you when you pluck the tongue it's only one tone that's plucked all of the different sounds that you hear are that that tone echoing inside your mouth echoing inside your throat and the sound of your breath moving it back and forth but when you change the shape of your mouth a e e o u that is amplifying the harmonics of that fundamental tone so it's a great it's a great way to learn about how overtones work and so you can apply that to any instrument with a mouthpiece uh any uh yeah i mean al almost any wind instrument you can apply the same sort of uh principle and and theory to um with uh creating overtone music uh nice. and oh uh, so oh you're and then I, you're asking about other yeah. instruments uh I, I i i could play almost i mean i play almost every I, you know guitar um uh, I, I do a little bit of piano. Uh, I, I do different, you know, percussion instruments and things like that. Uh, I also invented an instrument. Uh, I don't have it with me right now. It's at my studio, but I, in, I invented an instrument that I call the bromeophone. And what the bromeophone involves is, is another uh, kind of extension of that idea of harmonics. Um, I take the mouthpiece and more importantly, the neck of the bass clarinet and this neck fits uh, precisely uh, very tightly it has a very tight fit on a one inch diameter 
a PVC plastic tube. So once you have a sealed connection on a PVC pipe, um, you know, if you go to your uh, home improvement store where they sell, you know, they sell the big long pipes, uh, you can get like a 10 foot pipe or whatever, you can, you can cut it into different lengths. And then there are these little, um, you know, plastic connecting um, joints. You can build all kinds of things where the tubes all connect into each other. And uh, the particular way that I've designed it for my own uh, playing style is called the bromeophone. It is an unkeyed uh, contrabass, sort of like a contrabass clarinet, but it has no keys. It's all played just with the palm of the hand, opening and closing the different holes on the uh, pipes. And uh, it's uh, quite an extraordinary sound. And, and of course, with, with the CO's mouthpiece, it's, e it's even louder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and next time we, you, make, you will make a demo, I, I want to see it. Yeah, I saw the picture on the boat, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. this is a nice picture, but uh, I, I'm not sure. I, yeah, I didn't hear it, so. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, on, my, on my band camp, uh, there's an oh, album. Okay. So that photo, there's this the famous photo. I'm playing it on a boat in the ocean. Uh, that's actually it was uh, uh, recorded. The album was recorded on a boat in oh, Sweden. Nice. Uh, and nice. so that, that photo is actually a photo of the recording session. Um, and that album is available on my band camp. Uh, it's called Shouting Over Deep Water Blues. And the entire album is just the sounds of the wind and the waves and the birds and the ocean and the sound of the bromeophone and also some singing. And it's a very kind of uh, environmental uh, sounding uh, record recorded on the waves in a boat. <laughs> mm, that's nice. Yeah. So how, how is it to record on a boat? Because, uh, and especially to record like all the, um... The atmosphere, it's, uh, it's not an easy task, I guess. Well, I, I was very lucky. So I was invited to do this uh, recording session by my friend, uh, Henrik, who uh, he lives on, he has a little cabin on an island in, uh, uh, it's off the coast of Sweden. So it's about, uh, it's about like an hour or two hours from Gothenburg. And um, oh, nice. he was uh, doing sound design professionally for for movies so he has a collection of all the i mean i don't even know what these microphones are i mean they're these are like the nicest microphones in the world i think and uh and he has a, a portable digital uh recording setup and um you know he brought out all these special microphones that are you know they're made to deal with you know, if there's wind blowing, they can they can handle that. They can still record a good sound, even if it's windy and waves and and all that kind of thing. Because, you know, most um, um, you know most of the outdoor recording I do is I have a little handheld Zoom recorder. Uh, sometimes just uh, well, you, you you get back and listen to it later, and if 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 the wind is just blowing at one time it it just can kind of ruin the entire thing mm -hmm. if you don't you know if you don't have the right uh angle for recording um uh, but uh he he knew how to he knew how to deal with that and uh and so it's a very uh a very special recording session yeah and it's it's a beautiful area i i used to i, I worked uh, some a few months in in gothenburg i was studying the organ oh, wow. pipes Oh because wow! There have a lot cool. of people uh, making organ pipes in that yeah. city, so I was uh, yeah studying studying the acoustics of of the pipes. It was interesting. Wow, that's really so like cool. It. Gothenburg's yeah. Gothenburg's a really cool town, and um, yeah, you know, there's uh, I I think probably one of the best music scenes in Sweden. Um, people in Gothenburg are a little bit more. Uh, uh, they're a little more uh, wild than Stockholm. Stockholm's a little <laughs> bit, Stockholm's a little bit too fancy, you know. They're uh, so 
uh, I've always had good concerts in Gothenburg and enjoy enjoy spending time with my friends there. Yeah. yeah. We have a question from yeah. David. He said, that if you could have a single conversation with anyone in the world, who would it be and why? Uh, huh. Uh, hmm. That's not easy. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I'd have a conversation with Pauline here. She, yeah. <laughs> she, she's, we're, we're, we're having it right now. This is the most important conversation in the world in this moment. Uh, you know, what, 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 what could be, what could be more special than this? I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, I mean, you want me to name like some like really famous person or something? I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, well, okay. Like, uh, like living or dead, we could talk about a dead person, you know, I would, I would love to talk to Albert Eiler, uh, I, I, because you know, because I, I've listened to his interviews, uh, where he's talking about his music and his spirituality and how he expresses that through music, how he expresses how music can can heal, how it can change your life, um, and I, you know, I, I would just love to talk to him about that because I, I mean, I really think that he is, uh, as close as we've ever gotten to like uh like a jazz shaman you know for 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 like the jet for what a shaman does all in 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 uh you know cultures all over the world that is what albert eiler developed he was a, a saxophone shaman and and i would really just love to uh be able to talk to him about that um and i think i have talked to him about that in my own way but uh, but I, you know, in a person-to-person -person conversation, mm -hmm. uh, that would be that would be a, a wonderful gift to uh, be able to have that. Yeah. So he talked so, so. about the the saxophone. So he was playing saxophone, and actually, the first mouse pieces we made you was a was a saxophone mouse yeah. piece too. So what's your yeah. What's your relation with uh, with saxophone? Yeah, well, and and at that time, you guys weren't uh, doing any clarinet mouthpieces. No, I actually in the beginning. Was, yeah, a long yeah. time ago. So yeah. yeah. Mm. So yeah, so um, yeah, I I was playing on that mouthpiece, and I and I enjoyed it very much. Um, uh, I had uh, gotten deeper into playing tenor saxophone. And then also a little bit baritone saxophone. I, I have a baritone saxophone, but I'm actually, it's a very nice baritone saxophone, but I'm actually thinking about selling it because I don't really play it anymore. Uh, uh, I just, I don't know. I just never pick it up. Um, I've, I've never, I've never sold one of my saxophones. Uh, I've never gotten rid of a horn because you know they feel like family members mm -hmm. but but the fact is i i have too many instruments now i mean I, I i have nowhere to walk i've got all these instruments uh in my studio so um if you're looking to buy a baritone saxophone yeah. uh maybe you know just give me a call and we'll talk but um, with tenor saxophone uh as you know in uh, 2017, I did this tour across the country under the title, This Saxophone Kills Fascist. Um, and there were some very strong um, political motiv motivations uh, behind taking this approach to playing because I felt like uh, with the state of the world and especially the state of the United States of America, that our country really needed an exorcism, and I felt that I could maybe do that with a with a with a tenor saxophone, uh, playing the way that I do. I felt like I could I could do something to kind of initiate this exorcism and, you know, get all these these horrible uh, fascist demons that were taking over our country. Um, you know, um, I felt like I could create a sound that would just banish them from from the world um i don't know if uh 
I was successful in doing that, but I will say that uh, I played 60 concerts all over the United States. In, I, it was just two months all over the country. I played 60 concerts and not one fascist at any of the concerts that I performed at. So at least I did a good job at keeping them away from, <laughs> from me. But, uh, you know, I, I couldn't play everywhere at once. So I don't know. Um, and so, right, and we were talking about this before. I'm, I'm not really playing tenor saxophone as much right now. Um, the, the times when I do play, um, for example, um, there have been a number of uh, protest uh, marches and rallies, uh, you know, for Black Lives Matter, for, uh, you know, uh, uh, for the memory of people like George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, there have been marches in Olympia. And if, uh, if I go to a march, I will bring a tenor saxophone because it's like a natural amplifier. It, it can, you can hear it, you know, you can hear it a mile away, um, especially with, with a good CO's mouthpiece. Um, it, 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 it projects, uh, it's very loud. So it's a good thing to have, uh, at, at a, at a protest march, uh, or, or a rally. But, um, for my personal kind of musical practice, um, I mean, really it's all about bass clarinet. Bass clarinet is like my religion. I mean, I, I play bass clarinet every day, uh, for at least an hour, sometimes more, sometimes two three hours um i like i like if if the weather's if it's not raining you know because we're in olympia we we have a lot of rain but this week has actually been very nice so uh i've been going outside i go to the woods um uh it's kind of cool because um there's this one forest near the college uh where if I go out on the trail and I start playing, uh, the uh, the ravens start responding to me, and mm -hmm. so it's it's very interesting because, you know, if I if I do that if I do that kind of guttural sound, the you know the if you're if you're a raven and you hear that sound. You think that there's like a giant raven in the woods, and and you think like, oh, it's 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 mama, mama, what, what, you know. So you can have a conversation with the ravens with that sound. Um, it's quite nice. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> so, Raoul was asking if you are a shaman yourself. Well. Now you see the thing is if you call yourself a shaman you're probably not a shaman so <laughs> That's I a good answer. Yeah I I don't know I mean for me what I think the important thing to think about for me is that I uh I know that music is medicine and I use music in a medicinal way uh, I, I use it for myself. I, I, if I, if I'm playing and I'm vibrating and the sounds are going all up and down my body, uh, I, it's, it's like an inoculation. I know that I will always stay at a, at a healthy level, you know, mentally, spiritually, and physically. And I believe that in a, you know, in a, in a concert or in some kind of a, you know, a small group of people, if, if we're playing together, that we can kind of maintain that sense of like medicine. Um, we can also use music as a, uh, a jumping off, as a, a, as a launch pad into exploring other states of consciousness. So, you know, if you play certain, if you play in certain ways and certain, um, with certain kind of, um, I don't know, certain approaches or certain rhythms, you can use music to help you kind of go into a, like a trance state or into a sort of like a, uh, a meditative state or like a very awakened state. Um, you know, even maybe like a psychedelic state through music. So 
I'm not going to say that that's the same thing as, you know, shamanism in the classical sense, but I think that there is something in common with shamanism as it's practiced uh, around the world, um, just in the sense that we can use music as a medicine. Um, now, I don't know, you know, some of the other kinds of claims that you might make, I don't, I don't know, but, uh, um, but especially in this crazy time of, of COVID and, and, you know, everybody is kind of forced to uh, learn how to navigate a more internal uh, time. You know, everyone's kind of gotten a little bit more introverted. Um, it's, it's been a really good, I mean, uh, I don't know. Honestly, for me, it's been really good because uh, I've been able to kind of set aside a lot of other distractions and, you know, focusing on my own sort of introverted internal experience of how music affects me and, and you know, playing music in, you know, different rooms of my house. I can hear different vibrations in different parts of the house. And sometimes I'll play outside on the, on the front porch. And, you know, if I'm playing, like with the flute, for example, if I'm outside on my porch and I'm playing this flute, I've got all kinds of birds that will come and, you know, I'll stop playing for a little while and listen and all, you know, the birds are just, they're singing, they're going off and then I'll, I'll play a little bit more and I can, I can play anything I want on this flute and they're not, they're not scared. They don't, they don't run away. They don't fly away. They just, they stay and listen and they're kind of calling back. So, um, that's kind of like a, uh, uh, Biofeedback is the word that you could use. You know, you're you're establishing a resonance with animals, with nature. Uh, I don't know. Is 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 that shamanism? I, I I don't know. But that's it's it's something that feels very uh, magical to uh, to participate in. Yeah, actually. So you, we are talking about the all the. COVID situation and I, mm -hmm. I was wondering what was like the the main lesson maybe you draw from that uh, that crisis hmm. well I mean there, there, there are a lot of people are you know saying all kinds of things about uh, you know how we uh, I mean you know, we, we, we really need to have a lot more uh, insight into how our lifestyles affect the uh, ecology around us. And, you know, if, um, you know, people learned early on that it's like, well, you know, hundreds of millions of people around the world staying at home and not using their cars or, or trucks or, or, or buses or whatever, uh, well, the, the air gets cleaner, the water gets cleaner. You know, you start seeing animals kind of coming in and uh, coming into the city that aren't normally there. Uh, you know, that's, that's uh, uh, an interesting thing to observe. And I think, COVID or not, you know, we need to think about how our cities are built and structured and how we, uh, you know, how we structure this kind of capitalistic uh, nine to five lifestyle of, you know, people living, you know, some people have to drive an hour or two hours every day to, to get to their job. And, you know, maybe we can um, try to envision doing things a little differently than that. Um, and I, I think what eventually will need to happen is that we do things very differently from that. So uh, maybe for a lot of, you know, for a lot of people, maybe COVID is the first time that they've really thought about that. So um, if, if you've been accustomed to one very particular way of doing your like lifestyle, 
and you're suddenly forced to do, you know, a different kind of lifestyle. Um, you know, maybe it wasn't your choice to do it that way, but at least you might make some observations that like, oh, well, there are some things about this that are different that, you know, maybe, maybe not everything about this is, is a bad thing. You know, spending more time with your family, for example, spending more time with your children. Uh, I mean, that, that could be a very beautiful thing as well. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm kind of an optimistic person. I mean, I try to look at, I try to look at the positive uh, uh, aspects of, you know, yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, uh, you know, don't don't get me wrong. COVID's been an extremely, <laughs> very difficult, very, you know, it's been a horrible situation. I mean, a lot of people have died. A lot of people have been sick. Um, you know, it's been a mess. Uh, our governments have completely failed us. Uh, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of really bad things. But but I, you know, at least for me, I have to kind of think about some of the positive things, too. Uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's still the best way to do it. Like even yeah. if if it's complicated, then I need to to f think about what positive or what yeah what what can we get from that and where yeah. we should we go after that. So. And and I mean and one one more positive thing that I that I think really has to be said about it is that the ways that you know. Obviously, it's not the same in every country and every city, but in 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 our neighborhood, the way that the neighborhood has started to kind of people are sort of like looking out for each other and trying to take care of each other. Uh, you know, before COVID, people kind of like you know you live in your house. You know, sometimes maybe you maybe the person who lives in the house next to you maybe you like oh like hey what's up. Maybe you see them, but they, you know, they get in their car, they go to work, they come back from work, they come in, watch TV, whatever. It's sort of not really normal that you just like talk to your neighbor. But with, yeah. co with COVID, um, people have been organizing a little bit. You know, they're making sure like, oh, hey, like neighbor, do you, you know, do you have enough food? Because uh, I have a garden and I have a lot of vegetables in the garden. If you know, if you need any vegetables, just come and take some vegetables. You know, like that kind of thing is happening a lot more. And I see that in different neighborhoods around here in Olympia and and in Portland, Seattle. You know, I hear about different ways that neighborhoods are kind of paying a little bit more attention to the people living uh, in their community. And I think that that's that's always a good thing that's a really important yeah. thing that has to happen so that's that's been a beautiful thing that's uh happened out of this rather ugly circumstance as well yeah that's nice we maybe just uh before we finish uh, we talked a little bit about your painting but not too much i was uh yeah i wanted to to know more about that and uh yeah maybe maybe yeah it's it's uh, like Maybe the stupid question, but uh, <laughs> what would you choose between uh, uh, painting and uh, music if you had just one to, to yeah. keep? Well, I mean, I mean that's another thing with COVID. I mean, I, I've had a lot of time to paint because I haven't, uh, you know, when I'm, you know, normally, uh, because I, most of my. Uh, most of my work is with concerts and, and uh, for that I'm on tour. And so if I go on tour, I'm usually uh, traveling for, you know, two months at a time uh, in cars and airplanes and trains and all that. Uh, so I don't, ha I don't have time to do any painting when I'm doing a tour. So having a whole year with no, no concerts, uh, I've had a lot of time to paint and that's been really nice. But um, it's impossible. It's impossible for me to only do one. I, I can't only do painting. I can't only do music. Uh, they always, uh, they're, it, it's like they're two sides. They're two faces of the same, the same coin, you know, uh, because the, um, 
Um, I, 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 I don't know how to explain it. I mean, the, the, when I, when I, when I'm painting and I've got a brush and ink and I'm like moving around on the paper, it's like, that's like music for me. You know, that's, it's, I'm, I'm doing, I'm using the same part of my brain that I would be using if I were playing music. I mean, it's, it's, it's improvising, but it's also composing at the same time. I mean, um, you know, the ways that we divide sound into overtones and harmonics, you can do the exact same thing with colors, you know. You can take, you know, you could take your brush and just dip it into one color, you know. It's just, okay, this is just blue. But then when you mix it with water and it kind of like spreads across the paper, it's like, well, okay, that's blue, but there's like a little bit of green in there. Or, you know, if the light hits it in this way, there's like a little bit of yellow there. Or, you know, you can add, you know, it's, I don't know. It's it's hard to explain. It's a very sort of synesthetic thing for me. But, um, you know, I think that the ways that light and paint and color, it, it, it does the same things that you can do with sound. Um, you just, mm -hmm. you know, you... Um, I only have two hands, right? So I can't I can't be playing this and painting at the same time. But sometimes I'll be painting and I'll I'll be singing or or just like humming a little bit of mm -hmm. I'll be I'll be I'll be like singing just a little bit to myself while painting. So I can sing and paint at the same time. I just can't play an instrument at the same time. Yeah, it's a little difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and some of your um, paintings have been uh, used by uh, Yves Saint Laurent in his collection. So can yeah. you talk about the story behind that? Yeah, well, they they saw my concert posters, and it uh, uh, because uh, Hedy Slimane was living in Los Angeles, and they. Uh, um, they like to go see all the like the the big like rock and roll shows and stuff, and so they saw one of my concert posters hanging up at this club in L.A. called The Smell, and it was a poster of a is a woman, uh, uh, well like an angel, is a woman with wings riding on the back of a tiger, and and I guess what what they told me is that they had just had this meeting about doing some kind of print design with like women and tigers like like that was that was like okay for this season we're going to do something with women riding on top of tigers and then the the like the next day they saw this poster that i had drawn and so they uh, they emailed me asking about that and um and and I I actually did a lot of draw. I worked I worked for them for about a year, doing all kinds of different drawings for that one collection. And in the end, they didn't even use the drawings with the tigers. Uh, they just, they used a tiger print uh, and a uh, like a jaguar print for some shoes. But the 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 main painting that they did use was this um, like a, a a very complicated design with these like dragons and flowers and angels and I think it's called uh, angels and dragons in deep conversation and they made a a jacket and a backpack and uh, oh wait do I have it here oh I don't. I don't have, I don't have it. This is one of the backpacks. I have it right here. With, this is with the, uh, the tiger, the tiger print design. You Saint Laurent. Uh, but then the other one, the other one's at my studio. It's uh, with, with all the dragons on it. Um, so that was that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Can, do you think you uh, you can make some uh, noise now? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I'll play a little bit for you.
I'm going to take the headphones off because it sounds weird when I have the headphones on here. And the overtones on the on the flute. Yes. Now the lalove. This is a really special flute, and you. Um, the great thing about this is that you play it with circular breathing. So in Sulawesi, they'll have these kind of ceremonies where they just play all night. So it's uh, it's kind of a trance flute. Um, mm -hmm. You. They'll have a couple people playing and it's just you get into these patterns that you play over and over and over again it's it's very um a very mystical kind of uh feeling to be with them when they're playing <laughs> And so on and so forth. It it's like I kind of need to be playing for like fifteen twenty minutes before it really even like starts to mm -hmm. sound the right way. You know, it has to has to kind of warm up. But um, it's a it's a very powerful instrument when it's uh, when you uh, kind of dive into it. Yeah, it uh, <laughs> sounds really nice. Thank you. Now I want to go to Indonesia. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you for uh, making us travel a little, and um, yeah, I hope you uh, you enjoyed the the talk. It was really interesting. Thank you for uh, very much being yeah. being us yeah. uh, being here with us, and uh, yeah, I hope to see you in Paris soon. J'espère à bientôt. Oui, à bientôt. Ouais, ouais à bientôt. Au revoir. Ouais. Bonne journée. <laughs> Au revoir. Merci beaucoup pour la conversation. Mm -hmm. Et, uh, au revoir à tous mes amis à Paris, euh, en Europe. Euh, euh, je sais que un ami italien qui regardait euh, ce jour de Bologne. Euh, ciao, Paolo. OK. <laughs> à la prochaine. Yeah, bye. Have Merci good beaucoup. Good night. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.